All right, today we're looking at the uh, topic of cultural Marxism, uh, which is such a broad topic and to some degree uh, difficult uh, that it's, uh, it's hard to do one lecture on it even. And it's certainly the case that when you're speaking about it, you're going to be speaking in very superficial terms connecting a, a wide variety of writers uh, and um, talking about tendencies and influences rather than anything else. But I, I did say in an earlier lecture that I uh, spoke of the influence of, of Marx and the inf influence of Freud and uh, as, as threads that influence contemporary literary theory. Um, although they're not always explicitly referenced, in fact, rarely are they explicitly referenced, they have a sort of an outsized influence on uh, modern thinking, in large part because they offer a meta-narrative, both, both writers. Marx, uh, Freud, and as we saw last time, Nietzsche. So Marx <coughs> explains everything in terms of, of wealth. His work is called Das Kapital, uh, which is about capital. Uh, Freud explains everything in terms of the sub subconscious. Human life is explicable in terms of the unseen and yet powerful subconscious impulses that we have that drive us. And for uh, Nietzsche, it's the will to power. We saw that last time. So those, those are three explanatory uh, ideas that underlie these men's work, and that's largely why they are influential. They don't just have a particular interest group being promoted, otherwise it, it really does not affect others outside of it, other than that the others will say, well, this is plainly false. Or it might be what animates you, but it, sh it has no I effect on me. The fourth, I might add to it, is probably Darwin and Darwinism, which is also a species of materialism. Uh, and that's a biological theory, but I think it has a worldview that comes with it. And uh, I addressed that in the C.S. Lewis class and not here, and I'm not going to get into that uh, here. But cultural Marxism is, is rather different from Marxism. And I don't think Marxism is actually that particularly influential in uh, literature or even in the academy, although many uh, called themselves Marxists up until the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, which I watched on television. Um, and then a few years later, I was there, and there were still remnants of the Berlin Wall. And at the time, people were taking bits of it themselves and carrying them off. And I thought, What's a, it's a brick. Like, or, like, why would I take a piece of stone? Because I was stupid. I should have taken the piece of stone while it was there. And, you know, here's a, a, not, a little bit of history while it's still there. Um, but I didn't. But I did see it, and I saw some of the vestiges of it. So they're one of the places where you would leave um, East, or East Berlin for the West was called Checkpoint Charlie, and they had a little shop there uh, selling mementos of, from Checkpoint Charlie. And it was probably just there for a time because of the fall of the wall. But <coughs> what brings the cultural Marxists together is the failure of Marxism. That's what unites them. And yet their belief that Marx was correct. So what is the failure? Well, first of all, uh, Marx predicted that there would be a working class revolution in Europe, and particularly in the most advanced countries in Europe, by which he meant Britain, which in the late 19th century was the most technologically, socially advanced country uh, uh, in the world, and Marx spent some time there, and he thought that this situation was ripe for a revolution, the same sort of revolution that he said had taken place in France in 1789. And it would be uh, uh, a, a reading that would happen, it would happen out of economic interest. So the workers at present uh, were being unjustly treated because they weren't getting the fruits of their labors. The, the system was, uh, was rigged against them. So it was the aristocracy uh, 
and the middle classes that supported the aristocracy who were bearing the fruits of the working man's labors. And eventually, Marx thought at the next time there's a great political event or a war, when it broke out, the workers would seize the means of production for themselves and liberate themselves. They'd throw off the shackles of their uh, social superiors. And so First World War breaks out and there is no revolution. It doesn't happen in England. It doesn't happen in France. It doesn't happen in uh, the United States. It doesn't happen anywhere, in fact, <laughs> where we could recognize advanced capitalist society. So Marx's thesis has proved to be false, or at least what he thought would provoke it was false. And what rose out of, arose out of this was, an, and, and the only place it did actually take hold was in Russia. Uh, and there was the Russian Revolution in 1917 when the war was over. And Russia was the most backward country in all of Europe at the time, economically deprived. Uh, not really anything like what Marx described by this, but, but, but Marxism was one of the marks of, um, of the Russian communist revolution. But in the West, they found that the workers' movements were actually indifferent to Marx. They, didn't, they, they were wanting some sort of what we now would call social justice. They did want a better wage. They wanted better con living conditions. They were as Marx observed the conditions of factories, and they were, these were deplorable in many ways. So workers did unite, and they did try and uh, improve the conditions under which they worked, but they weren't willing to have a, a war, as it were, a, a civil war in their ranks in order to bring that about. And so the Western Marcus, Marxist uh, realized, and, and some of these workers even were supporting fascist parties. For the, Max, for the Marxists, this is, this is horrid. <coughs> and what they realized is, uh, the Western Marxists, is that Marx was wrong about the things that were most important. It wasn't only about money. It wasn't only about material wealth. There were other things that were important to working people. And so Marx's own view that, that literature and art is basically a bourgeois, middle-class interest and it really a, a, a unimportant to the working man, uh, that was reassessed by some of the cultural Marxists. They realized that culture was actually important uh, to everyone. Maybe not in the realm of art, but it was influential in, in other ways. So, And chiefly, I would say, um, what mattered to the working man was his family. And he didn't want to risk his family in a civil war. <clears throat> and that's what would happen. A civil war of the sort that Marx um, prophesied would risk uh, the, not just the family, but the whole structure of society. And actually, Western society wasn't as unjust as Marx saw it to be particularly not in the West. I mean, there were injustices, there were no doubt, and they were being decried uh, by uh, many people and, and working Christians' movements and, and, uh, and others. So there, there were movements in England, certainly to abolish child labor and so forth, and working for the women's right to vote and so forth. These things were also going on, not because they wanted the vote per se, but rather because women were being pushed into the labor market and they were not they were being exploited and they thought the only way we can resist the exploitation is to have some power in the system, the voting system, so there's a push for that. But that's what they want. They want improvements in the system. They don't want the system to be totally destroyed. <coughs> and, and what then happened, I think, and in particular in the figures, the early figures, I'm going to try and give a, a history, just a potted history of cultural Marxism. Uh, if you want more on Marxism, I recommend this man, Les Kozolowski. The main currents of Marxism, he has it in three phases. The third being the, the breakdown. Well, this will be the cultural Marxism. I actually personally don't see it as the breakdown. I see it as the uh, dissemination into every area, the acceptance, because it's not... So it, I'll backtrack. Initially, it was going to come about by violence and a, 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 a literal war within a society. What the Marxists realized is that the workers 
on, which, on whose behalf they wished to work did not want this, and they were not willing to do that, and they never would be. And so they committed to Marxism nonetheless, and sensing that there needed to be a reversal of the social hierarchy, they appealed to equality, just like the French revolutionaries did, right? Liberty, equality, fraternity. These hallmarks of the French Revolution are also there in Marxism. They also want equality, equality between the workers and the factory owners. <laughs> they also want uh, liberty. Liberty in what sense? Well, it, that can be interpreted in a wide variety of ways. Come the 1960s, it's sexual liberty. But it's actually long before that, even in the 1930s, it's sexual liberty. And I'll, I'll illustrate that. Uh, in this lecture. Um, as far as fraternity, well, the fraternity is of your brothers and your brothers are your fellow unionists. It's not humanity as a whole. It's your group, your social group. So those continue to animate um, the Marxists, but they realize that uh, this idea of leveling society through a, a violent workers' revolution um, and through military might is not the way forward. The way forward, and it's being presented by figures like uh, the man Antonio Gramsci, the Italian intellectual, and also uh, Georg Lukács. So I said, it. oops, I have to pull this off. I don't have to yank it right off. L-U-C-A-C-S. And Gramsci, which you already know. These men are operating in post war, post First World War um, contexts, uh, realizing that if they want to bring about the, the, the Marxist revolution, they have to do it more patiently, more subtly, and actually more radically. So it's not a full frontal assault. We need to. Uh, do it subtly and uh, by subversion and by using the cultural institutions that Marx thought were irrelevant. So culture under Marx is again a bourgeois fiction just like religion is. Religion is irrelevant. He says the opiate of the masses. But it's not relevant. It, what really matters according to Marx is just money, material things. Those are the real thing. But the cultural Marxists realize actually culture is the means and the vehicle by which Marxist ideology will permeate and eventually overthrow a culture. And so um, they start to reconsider who the prolet what Marx calls the proletariat, the working men, will be. Who are these people? And they start including people that Marx would never have considered. So he includes amongst this racial minorities and women, and criminals. Any minority that will, you can identify with some form of oppression. And by oppression, it needn't be necessarily overt oppression. It's just simply by virtue of being a minority. Because if you're a minor minority, there's an inequality in the sense that you're not in the majority. And all of them can be united under uh, the term structural oppression. So you get an alliance of, in some ways, totally divergent and disconnected groups. So what uh, allies criminals with women <laughs> and with racial minorities? Where, where is the connection there? There isn't, other than the sense that they all share an oppression by the structure as it currently exists. And that it's, it's actually in the area of women's health that the, car, the cultural Marxists make huge inroads. And the measure of their success is now evident in the common cause that people attribute to minority groups. So the Democrat presidential campaign is underway in the United States right now, and all of the candidates are, um, without distinction, accusing one another of racism they're all sexist, and they're all oppressive in some way. And that's how they 
are going to a attain the leadership of the party is to be the, the, the voice for the disempowered. And it's, it becomes quite silly and, and, and funny, but this is the, the common unity there is precisely the sense that we're speaking on behalf of the oppressed and all of these groups being minorities are ipso facto oppressed. So Marx or post-Marx, cultural Marxism realizes that the political and economic establishment aren't the main thing. So they disagree with Marx. Or if it is the main thing, that's not the way you go at it. You don't go about it through directly. You go about it indirectly. So you go after the family and you go after the church and the theological presuppositions of the entire culture. And now last time we, the, the lecture was called At War with the Word. And we observed in the animations of literary theory of the 20th, 21st century, a common antipathy to uh, even the word as a repository of truth and meaning, right? But if you push that a little further and more deeply, it's the antipathy to the word of God himself, the second person, the Trinity, the creator, the idea that there is a creator and that there's an order that he has established which can't change, and in fact, it's correct. The Marxists suppose this because it won't allow itself to be reconstructed without injustice, whereas to, in a Christian understanding, in a traditional understanding, there is an order of things of the cosmos which needs to be acknowledged and lived in accordance with, not subverted. To subvert it is to do injustice, not to do justice. So ultimately I see behind cultural Marxism as well as Marxism, the main focus of attack is actually Christ and his church. But in order to subvert it, simply by being anti-religious is, is insufficient. That has already been attempted quite frankly in liberal theology in the 19th century and to some degree in the 18th century and yet the culture remains more or less Christian in its understanding of the family, for instance, in its understanding of the justice system. There's a widespread acceptance that this is law and order. So the common law, the common law is literally what the common person recognizes as an injustice in front of his eyes. So you know when something unjust has happened. You don't need a judge to tell you. You don't need an authority. You yourself can say that's unjust. It's, it's actually percolated all the way down into the into common people's actions. So to subvert that, they need to subvert not the religion, but the family. Because most of what we have in our legal system is actually family law. And the Ten Commandments, at least the second uh, tablet of the Ten Commandments is related to family law. So the, it's not a direct religious attack, it's an indirect religious attack. So rather than attacking Christ, you, talk, you attack those that are made in the image of Christ. So the liberation needs to be from the family, and that means the family unit is a target for the cultural Marxist in a way that it certainly wasn't under Marx. And increasingly Christian theology and its working out into law and so forth is seen as a, an imposition on reality. It's, a, it's presented in the language of uh, cultural anthropology as a, as a structural imposition uh, by an ideology. So Christianity isn't now an ideology. It's not just the way things are. So the family unit, which every culture acknowledges, and it's there in the Tao, which Lewis calls, uh, it's, there's a man, there's a woman, there are children. That's a family. The uh, family gets redefined, and when it gets redefined, it gets broken. You can't redefine something without, without destroying it. You can't just simply add to it. You can't take away from it uh, without destroying the very thing that you're redefining. If the thing that you're redefining has an integrity and a relation to the order of nature. But again, for the Marxist, there is no such thing as nature. There's only culture. And again, language, to go back to what we said last time, language is 
uh, but I didn't uh, explicitly address this, I don't think. Language is now describing things as they actually are. So we, there's a reality to which language points. And come the linguistic turn of Heidegger, of Saussure and others, language now, ref words refer to other words, but they never refer to things, and they never refer to a nature, and they never refer to what we would call a metaphysical reality furthermore. That's all bunk. So now it won't come through violence, but it will through co come through cultural warfare. And the cultural warfare will directly target the family, but it will also be in the area of, of jurisprudence, the law. So rather than going against the law and against the political establishment, it'll work through the law and through elections and through charity. One of the chief aspects of Christian culture is the outworking of charity, which happens privately, it happens through the church. It's not a state thing. The idea of a state ch charity is a contradiction in terms, historically. Charity is what Christians do. The state is not Christian per se. It might want to acknowledge the good of Christianity, but the, the state itself is not the means of charity, at least historically. <clears throat> so charity will also be redefined. And I have up on the board behind me, come the 1990s, the third way in politics, which began in 1998 in the UK um, under Tony Blair's government, Anthony Giddens, proposed a third way in politics, which was going to unite or be a, a, a common ground between the left and the right. And what they establish is these social society organizations, which are state forms of charity. And so they're funded by the state. And now in our day, that's exactly what's going on. So there are all sorts of registered charities, registered with the state, funded by the state, doing things that are now called charities that have nothing to do with a Christian conception of charity. And in fact, they often are opposed to those very things. The women's health initiatives, the uh, sexual agendas that are in our schools and so forth. Um, and that they'll be allied at an even bigger level on the international scale with the social development goals of the United Nation. Have a look. Look up SDG under the UN's uh, blueprint for uh, 2030. Look at the social development goals and look at the social society uh, or civic society organizations and how they work hand in glove at politically, not just nationally and internationally, but even locally. You'll be shocked. But uh, the idea that human nature is itself a structure of oppression from which people need liberation, that's a later development. It's now in our day. So think about the language that's used in uh, common parlance. People even talked about sex of a male, female. You know, first thing you ask or used to ask a person when they had a baby is, is it a boy or is it a girl? <coughs> in the language of gender theorists, this is imposing a nature on the child, right? It's an oppression, it's a form of oppression to give an identity to something as if it didn't have an identity. But, but again, if all reality is linguistically mediated and only exists in language, then to call something what that thing that is called doesn't itself identify as is a form of oppression. So now they're politicizing language and they're politicizing human nature at the personal level. And the ultimate aim of this, to my mind, is to uproot Christ from Western culture and to uproot biblical law from Western culture. And if you look at, if you go to a Canadian Supreme Court, you'll note that the Supreme Court justices, they look a bit like Santa Claus because they wear these big red outfits and they've got white fur around them, or Father Christmas more, but they also have around their collar, they have two white sort of tassels hanging down. These are the two uh, tablets of the Mosaic Law. So it's traditional common law garb, at, at least in that sense, not the Christmas Santa Claus thing, but the, but the, but the two um, Mosaic tablets which ground all Western law, going all the way back to uh, the uh, Justinian Code, by the way, 
which is a fascinating thing. Have a look at that sometime, the Justinian Code. Have a look at his wife, by the way, the Empress Theodora, who was a Christian, former prostitute, and brought in a code that brought Christian uh, and biblical understanding into Roman law, gave property to rights to women, among other things, gave status to women, which they didn't have in Roman law uh, up to that point. So these things are uh, uh, big shifts. And I want to now, what time do I have? I need to move into some of the ways in which this gets played out. Um, you could look at uh, Gramsci, and he's the one I have uh, put down on our reading list here. Uh, Gramsci is an Italian Marxist supported by the Soviet Union, but thrown out of Italy when Italy uh, went in the fascist direction. But then he operated simply elsewhere. Eventually, um, it happens in Germany. And it happens in Germany in the 1930s, early uh, so late 20s, early 30s. Uh, an attempt to bring Marxism, and initially I think it is called uh, Marxism, but eventually that becomes politically. Uh, it's bad advertising, it's a little bit too truthful. <laughs> so they, it rebrands itself because Marxism is not popular, but let's talk about social development or something like that. Uh, and, and does take hold there. But come the Nazis into Germany in the 1933, it disperses from Germany and it goes to the United States. And there, um, that's where I'm going to pick up the story here because that's where it becomes um, harder to track, but, but discernible all the same. Um, I'm going to look at it under five main headings. So it plays itself out in, in various ways. Well, one is through something that Marx had no interest in, but the culture Marxists realized was hugely important, namely the role of the media. And even the entertainment industry. Uh, early on, the uh, school of Marxism settled around Frankfurt, and there's something called the Frankfurt School. And there are a wide variety of thinkers associated with the Frankfurt School. It disbands largely during the 1930s under Hitler. It's, it's a, a bad idea to be uh, promoting Marxism. This is a fascist country. Uh, but post-World War II, it, it reestablishes itself in, in Frankfurt. But in the meantime, many of their main thinkers move over to the United States. And some of them go to Hollywood. So let me talk about that first. Um, in the, uh, during the Second World War, two, two thinker, thinkers, Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno. I think this fellow is the most interesting myself, Adorno. But they go to Hollywood, and they spend a great deal of time there. And what they have learned from another writer by the name of Walter, uh, I'll give you the English pronunciation, Benjamin, Benjamin in, in uh, German, is that um, culture can be used to psychologically, psychologically condition people to accept views that they don't hold, and things that will even be antithetical to their views. So the family can be undermined through film by presenting alternative lifestyles and so forth and making them, making the audience sympathetic to the character. So the person would be ill-treated on film from the minority group. From when I say minority, again, the, the minorities as, as defined. And the law can be undermined through film and so forth. So people are moved by stories, in other words. The very thing that uh, literature teaches is the profound effect, Aristotle says it, that people are, are d love to imitate by their nature. What they see in front of them is oppression. What they see in front of them on the film is somebody fighting oppression. They want to imitate the same. So when it happens around them and they see somebody being uh, 
ill-treated who simply identi is identified with one of those minority groups, they find that there are people in their midst that want to come alongside them to protect the underdog. So that uh, happens there. And if you want an account of that, I think it's a popular account, but Ben Shapiro's primetime propaganda, the true Hollywood story of how the left took over your TV. He presents a little bit too much Republican Democrat, but it's, it's more or less accurate, I think, uh, his description of this. So that will be the first way, will be sent through pop culture. Pop culture, appeal to the masses, right? And the masses, again, are those that are supposed to bring about Marxism. They weren't doing it, well, how do we get that? Well, then we, we change their sensibilities and make them amenable to the Marxist worldview, which suggests that the current system is oppressive and needs to be overturned. Secondly, through something called studies and prejudice. This is really important. This is from this man Adorno. He writes something called Studies and Prejudice. I think it's 1949, but I'm, I won't say that as an absolute certainty. Um, or the umbrella is there. Actually, his work is called The Authoritarian Personality and it's published in 1950. But it's again, the aim is to attack prejudice and prejudices as nefarious, leading to oppression. So in this book, The Authoritarian Personality, uh, Adorno describes things that relate on a scale to oppression, and the scale is what he calls the F scale. The F referring to fascism. So there are various things on this barometer of fascism that Adorno identifies. Well, what are these things? Well, so if you get called a fascist in our day, you mean a fascist by being a, a man or su supporting patriarchy because Adorno regards supporting the father as fascist. Um, views on what constitutes a family. If you have strong views on what constitutes a family, this is fascist. Because again, the not, to be fair to Adorno, the Nazis had so strongly played on the importance of nature and, and what was unnatural. What was unnatural is if you weren't German, right? So if you were a Jew or you were gay or you were a Slav or you were actually anything that's not an Aryan German, you were substandard, you were a subspecies. You were an Untermensch. I talked about the Ubermensch, you're an Untermensch if you're not Germanic. And so they would actually literally go out in the name of nature to advance nature and seek to uh, cut out those people from the German people, the pollution. They were actually use this horrible term that people as, as, as if they were human vermin. So we're going to eventually it leads to the killing of the Jews and also the Slavs and also um, the, the sexual deviant homosexuality that are also oppressed, treated abominably, experiments being done on also on um, uh, the, uh, the gypsies. So whole people groups identified in accordance with the Germans idea of nature and of course their idea of a hierarchy within the human nature, because again, he, they call them uh, races, from which they get this directly from Darwin. And of course, for also from Darwin, they get the idea that there is a um, hierarchy within the species and a movement towards progress. Well, if there's a movement towards progress in all of nature, where do we see it in human nature? Answer, well, where it's most culturally advanced, where it's most socially advanced. And then guess what? In the early 20th century, Germany is at the top of that ladder. And yet the Germans are saying that they lost the war. Why did they lose the war? Because they were corrupt. We need to go back and defend the pure. So there's a movement towards the purity of the family and the Aryan gene pool and all that. So it's called social Darwinism. 
So when Adorno talks about uh, the F scale and the authoritarian personality and connects it with the father and with the family and with strong identifications with the family, he has in mind what the Nazis said in their propaganda about the family and about nature and about human nature. And so we have to be sympathetic with him on that. On the other hand, when this passes over into politics in the United States and in Canada and the West in general, we're not confronting fascism. Although to be fair, once again, the uh, fascist parties in Germany were not that much more numerous than they were in Great Britain. Fascism, fascism was very popular, even amongst the former king. He was one part of the fascist party of, of uh, Britain. And th that movement was in the United States and Canada as well. So there was a strong sort of uh, defense of nature. A and it's largely because, to my mind, because of Darwinism and its implications and the idea of progress of the human genome, if you will, and how to purify it and how to get rid of the disease in our midst. All sorts of language about this in the 20th century, and not just in Germany, it's ubiquitous. But, it, but uh, what it eventually does, and its application, is it, it anathematizes anyone who appeals to what are effectively Christian notions of the family or sexual ethics. It accuses them of fascism just ipso facto, you defend the family, you're a fascist. Most of the people who uh, make these claims have probably never even heard of Adorno, but they use his terminology of the authoritarian father and the idea that the patriarch is, is evil. We gotta get rid of the place of fathers and replace them with um, either the mother or, or a whole community. That's the second area. The third area is in what's called critical theory. Not always connected with cultural Marxism, but it, it certainly is there. Now, the word criticism is a good word, and it's one that I'm not going to get rid of. I seek to develop people who are discerning, which is the old word for critical, or the old sense of the word critical. You want to foster a critical mind. You want to critique things. I think ultimately it comes back from a, a Greek word, which is krinos, which is a touchstone. And a touchstone is something that will allow you to discern true gold from false gold. To, to be critical is to be able to discriminate right from wrong, truth from false, and so forth. But that's where we'll get the word critical. But that's not what's meant here, because that depends on an understanding of the Tao, which is itself uh, part of the fascist scale of things. To regard something as true or good and something as bad, that's already fascist. So w when Adorno defines the authoritarian personality, he's also anathematizing what Lewis calls the Tao. If you defend that, so if you think the, the family is good and and threats to the family or alternatives to the family that want to uh, undermine the legitimacy or the authority or the goodness of the family, uh, if you are against those, then you're a fascist. So now note that he's, uh, he's actually going after the thing that women most identify with historically, namely their families. And so in, co in communist countries, uh, women are brought into the workforce, not by choice, but by compulsion, because they want to create a society of workers. In the West, it doesn't come that way. It comes through propaganda. You want to get into the workforce so that you can be liberated from the shackles of the home and the limitations of your family and the domination of your husband. And you want to work for the liberating capital of your employer, I guess. If you work in the workforce for a while, you realize that your employer isn't, isn't so fancy after all, not so wonderful. They're obviously better and worse employers. But that, that in communism, it, I, it happens directly. Here it happens through attraction. Let's present the family unit as uh, unfair or unjust on women. Let's present 
the way of liberating ourselves from that and freeing us from that authoritarian personality as bringing women into the world of work, right? But critical theory here isn't there to develop discernment through appeals to fact or argument or logic uh, because that would have tied it in with what uh, R.V. Young called the word and the logocentric tradition because that's what that is. That would have brought it into liberal culture, the culture of freedom and dis freedom to disagree. Whereas uh, critical theory in uh, the cultural Marxist understanding never defines what it actually proposes, by the way. It simply d uh, opposes what is established already. So critical theory is a wholly negative movement. And, and the word criticism in our day has now passed into even in popular common understanding. If I say to, or if somebody says to me, you're a critical individual, they mean that you're a very negative person. Whereas one point I would have been said, oh, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I would see this as a way of being a positive individual. I contribute to the social good, to the good of, the, of an institution like a university by being a good critic. Nowadays, it has almost wholly negative connotations. Well, that's because of critical theory. Because critical theory only defines what it's against. And the reason it defines what it's against is it, it participates in what uh, Immanuel Kant, and so this is what marks it, its aff affiliation with the Enlightenment, what uh, the writer Hans Georg Gadamer calls Kant's characteristic prejudice against prejudice. This is of Kant, he said this. And the Enlightenment in general. They have a prejudice against prejudice. In other words, they regard prejudices as evil and they seek to eradicate the evil. It's an, it's a form of utopianism. We're going to create a better society by getting rid of prejudices. Prejudice, would anyone here want to be called prejudiced? Never, not a single person. But, but what, what uh, Gadamer observes about the, the term prejudice is if you look at the root of the word, it is actually just a prejudgment a prior form of judgment. And you're depending on that. In other words, it's what I described as understanding. It's the terms of commonality of the intellect that allow us to make discriminatory observations that are true. But Kant's uh, aim through inverting reason and understanding is to cut out the prejudice, the prejudices of, of prior understanding. Now, what are those? Well, some are the judgments of previous ages, so the, of the wise counsel of the past. But there's an even further prejudice, and that's the prejudice of our bodily human nature. There is a male, there is a female. Put the male and the female together, in a unity of what we call marriage, and you, you get a family, and you can procreate. But you're gonna find that as a family, and it's a, just a natural observation. But, but according to Kant, to even call it a family and to, get, to call it a good thing is a prejudice. So if you take this very radically, it's not just the judgments of the past, the philosophy of the past, the theology of the past, it's even the physical nature in which we operate, which is considered to be a prejudice and needs to be eradicated by critical theory. And even institutions are said to be prejudicial. So the church's judgment on the nature of reality, which it gets from the word of God, they will call these Christian ideologies. This is a form of prejudice, which we need to rationally examine and it has to accord with our reasoning. Not with our understanding, but with our reasoning. Um, and so in our day, um, we will see these critical theories ha have percolated into universities, into areas, and they're usually defined by what are called studies. So I do English literature, my colleagues do philosophy, history, whatever. 
those are old fashioned. They, sound, they don't sound very trendy or edgy or sexy. If you want to do something really edgy, then you're going to do something in the area of studies. And it would be cultural studies, but you can subdivide the cultural studies. So you can do women's studies, you can do aboriginal studies, you can do African American studies, you can do LGBT studies, you can do gender studies, you can do post-colonial studies. All these are studies. But note that the studies are connected with the human sciences. They're studies. They're, look, they're looking at it, but they're not actually, and they're, they're discussing it for sure. But they aren't saying that there's an order of nature which we are observing and simply talking, uh, acknowledging as it reveals itself to us. We use language rather to um, form the reality in this. Now, political correctness is very strong in all of these identity group studies that I just mentioned, and there's a thousand more. But if you want to see how much of a, uni a university has given in to a Marxist or cultural Marxist way of looking, look at how many of its departments are described as being studies. Note that they're not the humanities anymore. That itself is a prejudicial term. It suggests that there's something uh, intrinsic to humanity, which isn't also true of non-humanity, namely the natural world. And they certainly don't want uh, to acknowledge that there is such a thing as a common human nature. Or that human nature is to be understood in the light of God's nature, which was the whole basis of the modern or of the mediev that medieval institution in which we still operate, the university. Right? There is a unity and diversity within the Godhead. I talked about that a bit in relation to the Trinity last time. And uh, how do words relate to that? Well, that's the debate between the nominalists and the realists. Do our words truly describe the thing as it is, or do they, are they simply nomen? Are they names that we give to it? That's the early debate. So that's the third, studies. Um, cult, critical theory, rather. Fourthly, um, the idea of domination. So Marx argues that history is economically determined. If you own the means of production, you have the power. And, and the people with the power determine the course of, of society. But in the fr so that's Marx, but the Frankfurt School reimagines its, the group that it's defending. It's no longer the workers. It's changed the group. It's increasing. It is the workers, and they're going to add others to that spectrum. And eventually, they're going to get rid of the workers as their primal, primary support group, by the way. So the modern NDP, by the way, is not interested in the workers, the common workers. It says it is, but you look at the policies. The policies have nothing to do with that. They have to do with various minority groups and with, uh, with the environment and so forth. So they moved from humanism to post-humanism, in other words. But the Frankfurt School reimagines who the proletariat are, and it shifts it from being the laborers uh, to various identity groups. So now, whatever small identity group that is, you will see a hierarchy of oppression. So it used to be the uh, management or the factory owners and the laborers. So one was the oppressor, the other was the oppressed. Now, it works according to this binary opposition. The male, the female, the white, the black, the religious, the irreligious or the atheist, the straight, the gay, etc. Whichever has social approval and social standing is ipso facto oppressive of the others by virtue of its social approval. And so we're going to stand on behalf of those that don't have social, cultural approval and to seek to liberate them from the oppressiveness of the judgment that they are inferior or in some ways not good. And now it, so it, it's, it's no longer an act of oppression, it's a structure of oppression. And you've probably heard of structural oppression. And it's in our university campuses now when uh, students are called to check their privilege. So you walk into a room and you're done what? You get to check your privilege. What does that mean? 
I just walked into the room. What are you talking about? Well, by, it, by, by virtue of the fact that that group, your identity with that group, the, the, the superficial characteristics that mark you, m puts you into one of those camps. You're an oppressor. It's not personally, but structurally, which is even worse. Even worse. Because you don't even know what your privilege is. You have no idea. You walk around and you just simply assume. You don't know what it's like. Now, this is particularly effective in the public school system because it fits with John Dewey, the progressive educator's understanding of what uh, education is supposed to do. Uh, Dewey argues, by the way, that uh, it, it was irrelevant if children are taught specific facts or skills. They need to be educated not for the world as it used to be, but the world as it, it is going to be. So they had to be edu educated for the future. So let's not worry ourselves about knowing facts, knowing being able to read and write and so forth. That's not the primary thrust. It's, he's not denying the importance of that. That's our current day. That's not Dewey. Dewey's not as crazy as our contemporaries are. But he does say that the, important, the most important thing in school is not to fit into a state of being, but rather a state of becoming. It's, we're preparing people for the future. That future doesn't exist now, but it will exist. And the only way it's going to exist is if we prepare people for it. So they have to conform to a reality that currently doesn't exist, but it will exist. And the way you do this is you produce children who are what he calls well-adjusted. That's the aim of the progressive educators, to create well-adjusted children. Well-adjusted, adjusted to what? Well, to the future society that doesn't currently exist, but they will be prepared for that in the way that they think and look at the world. Now, this is so effective that by the time the 19th, 1980s came along, a man by the name of Alan Bloom wrote a, a book that I read in, when it came out. And what did he call it? Uh, the Closing of the American Mind. How Higher Education Has Failed Democracy and Impoverished the Souls of Today's Students. And he noted that the only virtue that people in the 1980s would acknowledge in universities was the virtue of tolerance. That's it. Not wisdom. Not truthfulness not justice, but tolerance. And he observed that the same virtue of tolerance was there in the Weimar Republic in 1920s Germany, which immediately preceded fascism. And he said, it's coming here. This is in the 1980s. Except it didn't come in the term of form of fascism. It came in the form of cultural Marxism. I think, and I don't think they're that far apart from one another in some ways, because they're both totalitarian. But once you have shifted what it means to be an educated person to being tolerant, or even uh, a better phrase, open-minded, if that's the virtue of a, an education is you're going to be open-minded, now you're ripe for the cultural Marxists to come in. Your mind's totally open. You have no prejudices left. You have no biases. You have no commitments to anything, not even to your own family, not even to your own health, not even to your own well-being, but wholly open-minded to the future. Now you are ripe for what Lewis in his Abolition of Man calls conditioning. And all, now all they, the educators need to do is give you the right opinions on specific questions, and then you'll be well adjusted. You just have to repeat those, and you will demonstrate that you're an open-minded person. And the right attitudes of the present will be directly opposite to those of the past, because that's how you will show that you're liberated and from the oppression of the authoritarian personality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Nietzsche calls this a transvaluation of all value. And that's exactly what's going on here. So uh, in uh, German, the Umwertung 
Sorry, I just can't help myself. The trans transvaluation of all value. The overturning of everything. Everything that was called good is now going to be evil. Everything that was uh, just will now be called unjust. And th he does it in the name of the Ubermensch. We're going to get rid of. We're beyond good and evil. That brings us to the final phase, and this is the one I'm going to conclude with and spend significant time. In the 1960s, we have a man by the name of Herbert Marcuse. Could talk about Foucault here, but I'm not gonna have time for this. Uh, I might get Foucault in a different uh, lecture. Uh, Many of the people that I talked about from the Frankfurt School that moved to America came, went back to Germany after the war. One of them stayed behind who was very influential. His name was Herbert Marcuse. <coughs> and what Marcuse did and what made him so effective was not that he wrote about, upon something that nobody before him had written, but that he was a good popularizer, uh, just like Richard Dawkins is. So some of the most famous figures culturally are not the best thinkers. It's those who are able to package it in a form that others understand it and can grasp hold of it. And some people are just very good at this. Uh, and it is a skill and it is actually an intellectual gift. I don't think it's just that they have a gift with the gap. They are able to teach, basically. And Marcuse is one of those. So he popularizes the very difficult teachings of his colleagues. Well, what are these um, teachings? Well. Marcuse's chief work is called Eros and Civilization, 1965. What does he say in Eros and Civilization? Well, he just presents the case that was made by a, a previous th thinker by the name of Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm Reich. And what's Reich's? Um, Two things, the mass psychology of fasc fascism. You know, it's hard not to be sympathetic uh, to a man in 1933 who is opposed to fascism right on the cusp of the Nazis coming into power. I mean, it's pretty hard not to be sympathetic, right, and like him. So the mass psychology of fascism in 1936, The sexual revolution. Who knew? You thought the sexual revolution began in 1968 with Woodstock and women burning their bras and all this sort of stuff. Right? Well, you probably didn't, but I did. My associations. Um, uh, the um, Sexual revolution, which we identify with the 1960s, is already written about in the 1930s, and it's written about by Wilhelm Reich. And um, what Marcuse says is what Freud calls, uh, th there is, there's an eros, a lust, a sexual desire, which is non-procreative. What does that mean? It's not directed towards the opposite sex. That's what it means. And he's going to liberate that. We're going to liberate non-procreative eros. Because at the moment, there's only one, one accepted form of sexuality, and that's heterosexual sex within the confines of a marriage and so forth. But if we're, if we're going to create a liberation from that and a sense of freedom and a sense of equality, we have to liberate the non-procreative eros and acknowledge what uh, Sigmund Freud calls human nature's polymorphous perversity. That's Freud. <laughs> 
he, he still calls it perversity. But he says that this is what explains so many people's um, what we now call mental health issues, but people have paraphilia. They, they have sexual desires for all sorts of things. In fact, the, the list of things is almost endless. Freud sees it as a, a, a distinctive mark of human nature, and he thinks that it's part of our subconscious even. He, so he identifies it in, in men in what he calls the Oedipal complex. Women or men, young men, want to marry their mothers, and they want to kill their fathers. Likewise, the electric complex the other way around. So it's something that's forbidden, and yet people desire it. Freud says that every man desires to marry, to do this with his mother. And I think, really? Okay. But he, he puts it in his notes, in his notes on Oedipus's, uh, Oedipus Rex. He writes in the margin notes on this. Uh, and he says that this, and if you're, if you're in the realm of psychology, you'll note that there's, there's substance to this polymorphous perversity, by the way. People are sec have sex with almost everything. But here he says that in Marcuse, and, and here it's a hybrid of Marx and Freud, and it's the case first made by Wilhelm Reich, that we can only create the new paradise that Marx envisages if we are going to liberate this non-procreative eros through polymorphous perversity and to say that it's a good thing. Not just allow it, not just tolerate it, but call it good. And to denigrate and call bad all, what was previously called an acceptable good form of sexuality. So now he's brought an assault on, the com on common sense in the realm of the family. And again, think of what's happened in Hollywood, <laughs> and you will see presentations that will talk about a liberation when somebody cheats on their spouse. And they will be you know, exhilarated by the consequences of all this, and so forth. And he will um, destigmatize every sexual expression except heterosexual marital relations, which he says are marked by sexual repression, because of course everyone has polymorphous perversity. So the only reason that you don't act on that polymorphous perversity is because you're repressed. So sex ed teaching needs to liberate you from that repression. And though that, so that now he creates a whole new class of victim group. Who is, the sex, who is the victim group? Well, it's what would have previously been called the sexual deviant. And he allies them with the blacks and the women and the working class. Now, if you look at this coalition, it's a very strange coalition. Because if you know anything about the black community, there tends to be a fair bit of antipathy towards the gay community. It's very strong, stronger than uh, the white community, in my experience, um, at any rate. Um, and, and likewise, the working class. The working class is strongly anti an antipathetic towards gays, historically and probably to this present day. But these are thrown in a coalition politically in Democrat politics, in New Democrat politics in this country, in labor politics in uh, the United Kingdom, and throughout Western on the left-leaning wing. And this is what happens in the 1960s. And one of the children of the sexual revolution, and in Canada, its main spokesman was Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who revisited uh, the Family Act and uh, destigmatized, actually decriminalized sodomy, and also allowed for abortion and so forth. That it opened the, the door on those things, but it's in step with the sexual revolution. Historically, this has nothing to do with the working class. In fact, the working class refused to go into war because what would be at risk would you would lose. Well, think about this: you would lose your family. You, you might lose your life in that. Well, that would leave your family without somebody to, to provide for them. Are you really going to risk your life for that? No, you're not, because you value the person behind you, the, the, the kids behind you, more than anything else. And you don't see your, your fellow Englishman or Canadian or American as your enemy. You might be angry at them. You might think they're unjust, but they're not my enemy. There's somebody I need to work with and in bringing about a just society. They aren't the symptom of an unjust society. 
At any rate, um, what it does is it breaks an antipathy towards uh, sexual deviance in the left. And eventually it becomes a mark of being on the right side of history that you will promote this with full-throated support. So you have to march in the pride parade or whatever. Right? And it's even, on, e even now in conservative politics. Are you going to march in the pride parade? I don't know. I'll think about it. I don't think it's that important. You have to march in the pride parade. Why? And you're howled at by the media because if you don't do that, you're, you're, you're not uniting against a symbol of oppression. That's why. You're an oppressor. If you don't support it, you're against it. You can't even be indifferent on things. So it's Marcuse and the Frankfurt School using Freudian psychology, which pathologized Christian morality, I will say. And they will deem it uh, a cause of phobias. By the way, this is probably 1967, the first use, first use of the word homophobia exists. Phobia is, a, is an irrational, unconscious fear of things, like you're afraid of spiders or, or mice or the dark or open spaces. These are all defined forms of phobia, or now it's Islamophobia as well. These are irrational, subconscious fears. Now we add homophobia to. And in nowadays, it's presented in different terms. There's a heteronormativity which we need to subvert, or the binary we need to deconstruct, because again, it's a, a symbol of oppression. Well, this is all in the wake of Marcuse. And he is so popular during the uprising in 1968 in Paris and Berlin, they march under the banner Marx, Mao, and Marcuse. You've heard of the first two, you've probably never heard of Marcuse. But Marx, the great German founder of communism, Mao was the Chinese communist leader at the time, and now we've got Marcuse. They draw the links themselves. It's even used in college, college dorms. So when you're being sexually promiscuous, you're actually liberating the world. You're making a statement about how you view things. Now, the problem with this, the problem with this, and the problem with the whole endeavor, I'm going to finish with this, is that Western society, and that includes whether you're on the left or on the right, in his day, regards... Uh, liberal society is the main problem and here's why whether you're a democrat or you're a republican or a conservative or a liberal whatever or a conservative party and labor party whatever the political structure is they are going to come from the tradition of political disagreement in public so you stand on both sides of the aisle uh, of the house of commons you've got her majesty's government you have the opposition one stands up and the other opposes it but they do so in a civil way and they do so on the realm of ideas and what would be the best way of thinking. But what they're not debating about is the very nature of the society in which they live, about human nature. That's not what they're not debating about, that they assume that it's good. They all assume that taking human life is a bad thing. And they all assume that protecting the family is a good thing. And they all believe that upholding the rule of law is a good thing. And they all believe that freedom under the law is a good thing. And equality under the law, these are good things. It's in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, right? Everybody agrees with the stated aims there, more or less. But here's the problem with that. This is the legacy of, of tolerance, probably the result of John Locke and his edict on tolerance, toleration. So 300 year legacy uh, in the English speaking world of public disagreement, even radical public disagreement, such that Voltaire in the French context says, um, I hate what my opponent says, but I will die for his right to say it. That's tolerance, right? That's tolerance. Like you think this is false, but I'm not going to kill you for the falsehood or the lie even. I'm going to expose you and debate you in public. That's toleration. And Here's the problem, they never get down to discussing the, the substructure of prejudice. And so in order to do that, we have to redefine tolerance. And so that's what Mar Marcuse does in a 1965 essay called Repressive Tolerance. <laughs>
You can read it. It's available online in a PDF. He says that this notion of tolerance of the Anglophone world has a certain sense of common sense, a common ground, a common human nature, a common agreement. But it's, its common source of agreement is assuming, he doesn't call it the Tao, I'm calling it the Tao. And we need to, and for him, it's repressive and it's totalitarian and we need to uproot it. And well, how will we do this? And he says, even the attempt to be fair-minded and open-minded and impartial and give the other person a hearing, he says that these uh, marks of civil society have to change. We will no longer tolerate somebody who is open-minded or liberal-minded or impartial or the idea of the free press. We have to get rid of those because they support the status quo and the status quo at its roots is what have to be, has to be changed. And so he will say, the tolerance expressed in impartiality serves to minimize or even absolve prevailing intolerance or suppression. And he argues that there is now a subtle form of structural domination that civil society has simply come to accept, even if it means endemic structural injustice against what? Well, against the sexual things, about against the nature of a family uh, on human life. So think of all the issues politically that are now animate um, our politics related to abortion and euthanasia. By the way, those are the mar two marks of the beginning and the end of life. So if you can produce legislation on the one and on the other, you've defined everything in between it. Does the, po the state have the power to define what life is? In the politics of the West, post-1968, the answer is yet yeah, not only should it, it must. And it must get rid of the prevailing notion of what human life is. And the idea that Killing is evil. That has to go. It's not killing. It's freedom. It's promoting choice. So there's a structural domination, and he says that we can only get liberating tolerance. So he calls the, this status quo, this political freedom that we have in the West, uh, as a legacy. He calls that repressive tolerance. We've got to get rid of that, and we have to bring in liberating tolerance. And he says, the realization of the objective of tolerance would call for intolerance towards prevailing policies, attitudes, opinions, and the extension of tolerance to policies, attitudes, and opinions which, which are outlawed or suppressed. And so what's necessary to do so, I'm going to conclude with this. He says, here I quote, it is necessary to break the established universe of meaning and the practice enclosed in this universe in order to enable man to find out what is true and false. We need to break the towel. To become truly autonomous, to find by themselves what is true and what is false for man in the existing society, they will have to be freed from the prevailing indoctrination, which is no longer even acknowledged as recognized as indoctrination. So now what constitutes liberalism, the left, is actually an attack on liberal society. In the name of toleration, there is going to be no tolerance for those that oppose your view. It's going to be brought in by force in the name of liberation, even though in the past we would have called this a dictatorship. But remember, this is the way of the future. So now I'm now getting into the realm of politics. I don't really want to do that per se, but, but here's the problem for cultural literary theory. It, it veers in that direction, and there's no avoiding it. It becomes a part of the academic enterprise, and even in universities, and universities are the, the chief uh, realms whereby this practice takes place, and people are indoctrinated and become advocates for social change, and they go and pick it alongside my fellow natives, the Mohawks up in wherever, you know, that, where do you think these people are coming from? Well, some of them are paid protesters from the United States, but others are coming from York University and the like. You know, it's, it's grad students that are there, allying themselves with the poor oppressed natives. The natives that actually wor worked 10 years with the government to agree on the pipelines, but now we're going to subvert the whole thing. Um, but so you can see the inversion. Now you can see how that's going to affect even the study of literature. Well, it has nothing to do with literature anymore anyway.
what is literature? If I teach Shakespeare, then I'm teaching an oppressor. I'm going to have to teach a marginalized group in order to liberate us from the delusion about what constitutes valuable literature. So what we, I began the course with, with uh, um, the Marxist, um, Terry Eagleton, we might come a day when Shakespeare is no longer regarded as literature. Well, we, we're in that day. It's, it's here uh, in the academy. Uh, so that's it for now. Uh, if you're interested in a, a critical work on Marcuse, this one by Alistair McIntyre is a good one. Alistair McIntyre is a Catholic social philosopher. He's a good thinker, but not much there otherwise. See you next time. <laughs>